going on, Vinyl Community? Welcome to another video with The Record Spinner. It's the dawn of a new year, and we all know what that means in the Vinyl Community. That's right. In today's video, I will be taking part in the 2021 Vinyl Tag. Uh, these tags always occur in the beginning of a new year, and it's a series of 20 questions that you answer, and each answer corresponds with a record in your collection. Now, personally, I love doing these because it's quite the exciting challenge to see what records that I own correspond best with the questions uh, they can uh, easily show how varied one's collection could be and they serve as great primers for newer channels who are interested in making content for youtube but don't know where exactly to start so these yearly vinyl tags are surely a great place to start so enough of the chit chat let's jump into what this video is all about number one a discovery in 2020 one of the bands that i discovered in 2020 was this band here cigarettes after sex i found out about these guys on tiktok of all places and i was watching a video on there and i heard this song playing in the background which i happen to like and it didn't say on the bottom of the screen like what the song title was and who was it by it was like a remixed kind of slow down version so i had to go off of whatever lyrics i heard playing in the video clip uh plug them into google then click on a youtube link to hear these guys and i'm very glad that i did that because i would say out of 2020 this is the one discovery that i am glad to have made uh very much in the vein of like Beach House and Silver Sun pickups, very much in like that airy dream pop kind of vein, very minimalistic production values and instrumentation, everything soaked in reverb, very androgynous vocals, it's just very nice, it's such a soothing listen, I have the two uh, main studio albums that this band has put out so far, and they have a couple of EPs as well, which I have not gotten my hands on, but this album in particular is their first album, and this features the song Apocalypse, which was the song that I heard on TikTok. TikTok and basically ignited my love for this band. Number two, a quarantine buy. So I bought a lot of records in quarantine uh, because since I was out of work, I was also collecting unemployment. And out of what I would receive every week, I made it a point to buy records from mom and pop stores that were running solely online because let's face it, they needed um, our business to kind of stay alive through the troubling times that 2020 had brought on to us. And um, basically, it was just a matter of searching through Discogs and just seeing you know what stuff was out there that I didn't have and also picking up a lot of new stuff that I was very curious to listen to so there was a lot of new things that I got but one of them was an album that I have been itching to listen to and dig into for the longest time that has some obvious King Crimson ties and it is the soul album by McDonald and Giles so this album features Ian McDonald and Michael Giles two guys in the original lineup of King Crimson and they basically did this album after they had left the band and honestly it sounds like in places it sounds just like a long lost you know follow up to in the court of the Crimson King you know some songs could have easily fit into the Crimson mold a little bit more kind of psychedelia infused um, Peter Giles appears on this album as well of course you know Peter and Michael were brothers they joined forces with Robert Fripp they did Giles Giles and Fripp then that turned into King Crimson and the rest is basically history but uh this right here is actually a recent reissue that has come out uh in the past couple of years and it comes on pink vinyl there hope you guys can catch that and it was such a pleasant listen it's just absolutely epic and it definitely just sounds like i mentioned like a long lost king crimson record number three an lp you want to find in 2021 so one of the albums that i have been looking for for the past year or so and i still am looking to this day is this album dream theaters black clouds and silver linings uh basically this album was given a one-time pressing back when it initially came out in 2009 and it's basically now out of print along with the other uh dream theater albums that are on the roadrunner label and that album to me just holds a lot of sentimental value to me because i remember when it came out in june of 2009 it was literally the soundtrack of that entire summer and it just absolutely 
intensified my love for Dream Theater even more because I really was into the previous album that had come out before that, Systematic Chaos, which is another album that I'd really love to find. Uh, but Black Clouds and Silver Linings just took it on a whole other level, and I just listened to that nonstop during summer of 2009. And it's an album that I still thoroughly enjoy. I have come across copies that were available within the U.S. for kind of decent prices there's no way that now i could get it for retail value the prices have definitely inflated but it's always been a case of you know i'll get to it at some point and then turns out it's gone from discogs or rebay so i'm hoping that either i can find an original pressing for a decent price or who knows maybe it gets reissued and all my prayers are answered fingers crossed number four a box set now, if you know me and you're a longtime viewer of this channel, you know that I love me some box sets, whether it's vinyl or CD. I could have honestly just closed my eyes, pick out a box set, and that'd be the end of it. But I decided to bust out the heavy artillery for this one, and I chose the monolith that is the Beatles in mono box set. I am very fortunate to own this box set. Uh, this features um, the albums that the Beatles released from 63 to 68 that were released in mono. They used the original analog tapes for this instead of the 2009 remasters like the stereo box. Uh, they recreated the tip-on style jackets. Uh, they also included the three LP uh, mono masters, uh, which is all like the singles, B-sides, and offcuts uh, onto one collection using the original analog tapes they just made a compilation reel for that includes a hardbound book and it's crazy how the value of this has skyrocketed for many many years you would think that there would still be a demand for this but it's going for like a thousand dollars plus at this point it is absolutely insane and i paid roughly a quarter of that which is just insane to think about, but this right here is one of the crown jewels of my vinyl collection. I would never give this away, never trade it off. Let's just say when my time is gone, my kids will be blessed. <laughs> it's just an absolutely awesome set. Number five, a concept album. So I have a couple of these in my collection, and the one that I decided to choose is the last album by Rush. This is Clockwork Angels. Uh, this album is basically about... Um, a person that lives in a world of alchemy and steampunk as he goes to fulfill his dreams and he comes across all kinds of things such as you know circuses cities of gold and just all kinds of crazy stuff uh it's an absolutely ambitious album and it's a great album to leave the rush legacy on because of course this is their last studio album since neil peart unfortunately passed away in 2020 and honestly the rush legacy was wrapped up perfectly with this album especially Especially with the opening track the garden which is just a tearjerker of a song it's just tranquilly beautiful like if you have not heard that song pause this video and go ahead and listen to rush the garden it's just absolutely beautiful and an absolutely adventurous concept album indeed number six an album where an artist slash band changed directions for this one i picked Yes is 90125. This came out back in 1983, and this is a radical departure from the Yes that everyone knew and loved from back in the 70s. Gone were the days of Roundabout and Heart of the Sunrise, and what you have here is basically a traditional 80s pop album because in the yes lineup now we have a south african uh, guitarist singer and songwriter trevor rabin uh we have a keyboardist original keyboardist uh, tony k back in the fold along with of course john anderson chris squire and alan white and um basically this album had a huge mtv hit uh, with the song Owner of a Lonely Heart, along with other tracks such as Hold On, It Can Happen, Leave It. It's just, it's almost hard to label this as yes at times because it's so radically different and so left field for them. But it basically kept the band alive and rejuvenated in the 80s. Um, and honestly, you know, aside from the sound of the band being completely different, this is in all honesty a very solid album with lots of great tunes. And like I said, it kept yes alive in the 80s. Number seven, a white label promo. 
So I personally don't have any white label promo pressings in the truest sense. I know exactly what they are and what they entail to collectors, but I still have something to show for it, which could be considered a white label promo. And that is in the form of a bootleg. This is kiss sonic boom over london uh this was put out by a label called heavy metal heroes records and they do like for the releases they'll do like multiple different pressings of a release they'll do like a black vinyl version colored vinyl picture disc but then what they'll do is uh, they'll do like a quote-unquote promo copy and just to kind of match it up with the uh with the plot of this particular question the labels look just like that so that right there is basically considered to be a white label promo and there is also another indicator as well because as you can tell uh there is a japanese obi strip uh, around the cover and if you can see right there that's a little sticker placed on the obi and that indicates also that this is indeed a promo copy number eight a compilation album now, I could have picked a lot of different compilations that I have in my collection, but for the sake of just covering a wide scope of artists and bands that I love, I decided to go with the band that is on my shirt. It is Queen's Greatest Hits. This came out back in 1981 to correspond with their 10th anniversary. And honestly, this is one of the cases where a compilation really works because it's a double-edged sword because... You're trying to appeal just the casual new fans, and then you have some people going on about why wasn't this song featured or whatever. But in this case, I think they nailed it because it starts off with Bohemian Rhapsody, goes into Another One Bites the Dust, Killer Queen, Fat Bottom Girls, Bicycle Race, You're My Best Friend, uh, Somebody to Love. I mean, literally, this is absolutely perfect. And there's a reason why this compilation slash album is the best-selling UK album of all time because it really is perfect. This is great for new Queen fans who want to kind of just scratch the surface of their legacy. And if you're just a big Queen fan and you want a dash of everything and you don't want to pull out multiple albums, this is a good compilation to spin. Absolutely fantastic. Number nine, an album that tells a story. So I do have a bit of a sweet sentimental story when it comes to King Crimson's and the Court of the Crimson King. Uh, back in June 2016, when I met the girl that was to be my girlfriend for at this point four and a half years, Sam, otherwise known as the CD player, uh, on that day I was wearing a t-shirt which had this striking album cover on it. And right off the bat, I mean, this is not, you know, the most cutest album cover that you could possibly see. So I can only begin to imagine what was going on in her head at the time when she saw this long-haired dude wearing this, uh, this album cover on a t-shirt. But I guess I made a good first impression because she was able to bypass the shirt. And then we started dating uh, on June 20th of 2016, roughly about a month later. And she became aware of my music tastes and my passion and how much I loved progressive rock as well as king crimson and this album because i feel like it's been said a million times over but dare i'll say it again this album is literally music history it is the birth of progressive rock there was nothing quite like this album back when it came out in late 1969 and king crimson basically started the whole I guess you could say progressive rock genre. I mean, of course, we had traces in the past with like the Beatles and the Moody Blues, but these guys just took it on a whole other dimension. But as I was saying, uh, she became aware of how much I loved this album and was she was very fascinated by it, of course, just by the album cover alone, uh, that this was actually the first album that we listened to together as a couple because that's something that we like to do. We like to sit down and listen to records. She closes her eyes, lays down, and just really gets into the vibe of it. And the first one that we listened to was King Crimson's In the Court of a Crimson King. What a great place to start. Number 10, an album that needs a vinyl pressing. So obviously, I, mean, I can't really show a record for this one, but I chose this right here. This is Pink Floyd, the early years, 1967 to 1972 uh, creation. Now, uh, they released uh, the early years box set back in 2016, and they also released this little two CD 
highlights kind of release, which kind of, you know, takes all the good parts and puts them on the two CDs. And I'm surprised that they didn't do a vinyl version back when this first came out, because uh, when they did uh, the later year's box set um, a couple years ago, uh, they did the big box set itself, they did a highlight CD, and then they also did a two LP version of the highlights. And so I'm kind of wondering why they never did a vinyl version of, of the highlights release for the early years. Hopefully it's in the can at some point uh, because Pink Floyd vinyl products nowadays are fantastic. The reissues are great. And uh, this is something that I would definitely love to see uh, released on vinyl, hopefully in the foreseeable future. Number 11, a common album and an uncommon album. So I'm actually going to stick with the same artist for this one and also the same album to some extent. So obviously the common factor, David Bowie, Hunky Dory, fantastic record here. This features Changes, Oh You Pretty Things, Life on Mars, uh, Queen Bitch, the Beulet Brothers. This is kind of Bowie starting to merge into the sort of glam rock, you know, kind of vein. Uh, just an absolutely fantastic album. And then the Uncommon album is this right here. So this is the B.O.W. promo album. So Basically, what entails with this is that back at the time uh, when Bowie was working on Hunky Dory, um, he had yet to find a record deal. He had not signed to RCA yet. So Tony DeFries at Main Man, which was uh, Bowie's manager, had put out 500 copies of this record, which featured David Bowie on one side, featuring uh, some early, like, rough versions of stuff that would be on Hunky Dory. And then the B side featured uh, some material by another main man artist called uh, Dana Giuseppe. And uh, these were kind of, you know, shopped around to record labels and such. And it's called B.O.W. promo because that is what was inscribed in the dead wax of the record. And so they actually reissued this for record stores day back in 2017 i want to say they just feature uh the bowie tracks uh featured it doesn't feature the uh, dana giuseppe stuff but basically we have some like early kind of like rough mix versions of like oh you pretty things eight line poem kooks uh it ain't easy which actually appears on ziggy stardust but it was recorded for hunky dory uh queen bitch quicksand but then it also includes a track called bombers which I think it appeared on, like, the Ryko Disc CD version in the early 90s as a, as a bonus track, but it is such a fantastic song that I think if it swapped out, like, I don't know, Fill Your Heart or something on this album, it would make this album just an inch better. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a rather uh, fascinating release to own if you want to kind of check out a rather different alternate version of David Bowie's Hunky Dory. Number 12, an EP. For this one, I chose... Genesis Spot the Pigeon. This came out back in 1977. Uh, this features some tracks that were recorded during the sessions for Wind and Weathering, but they did not appear on the final album. They kind of just don't really fit the overall kind of flow of Wind and Weathering. Uh, the three tracks that we have here are Match of the Day, Pigeons, and then one of the best Genesis songs ever, Inside and Out. Um, Personally, I think it could have maybe squeezed into Wind and Weathering. Um, it's just that great of a song. It's a shame that it just appears on an EP that tends to get overlooked. Uh, but this is a really solid EP overall. This is the Audio Fidelity pressing that came out back in 2012. One side's mastered at 33 and a third. The other side's mastered at 45 RPM. Sound spectacular. Pressed on blue vinyl. Absolutely fantastic stuff. Number 13, A Girl Group. For this one, I picked the sole self-titled release by The Black Bells. Now, The Black Bells uh, were a band that was on Jack White's label, Third Man Records, and it also features uh, a rather uh, notable person on the Third Man roster, and that is Miss Olivia Jean. She's done uh, session work for a lot of singles on the Third Man label, and she did a couple of albums on her own on the label. Um, very much kind of like, I guess you could say gothic garage rock uh these girls really knew how to rock they even did a uh, a collab single with uh stephen colbert which is quite humorous uh but now nah, this is a really fantastic album if you're really into like kind of heavy garage rock with a slight gothic twist in terms of the sound and the imagery uh this is an album that i really do recommend checking out this is a fantastic record indeed number 14 an album cover you love now this one was really tough because in general 
album covers are art alone, and some of them constitute as being just simply brilliant by themselves without any musical accompaniment. They're just great to look at. But for this one, I picked Sabbath Bloody Sabbath by Black Sabbath, and I absolutely love the artwork on here, and I love the contrast between the artwork that appears on both the front cover and the back cover because it's basically the same concept because you have a guy right here who's like in a nightmare kind of trance he's being possessed by demons he, there's like the 666 on the uh the bed stand with a skull just really brutal stuff and then you turn it over and you basically have i guess that same guy in kind of like a um, almost like a deadly grim kind of state with women around him and people with like, you know, their heads on the bed and disbelief, uh, just really kind of dark type stuff. And I just, I love this album cover. I have yet to find a t-shirt with this album cover on it. And sure enough, I will wear it proudly. Really, really cool stuff. Number 15, an album that you've listened to the most. And honestly, I don't really keep track of how many times I've listened to certain albums. Sure, I may have listened to some more than others, but if there's one album that I've definitely played a good number of times and surely never get tired of, it is The White Stripes Elephant. This right here is probably one of the best rock albums of the 2000s alone. Of course, this features Seven Nation Army with that classic... Da, 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 melody line black math is on here i just don't know what to do with myself in the cold cold night which features uh meg white on vocals uh want to be the boy to warm your mother's heart we have the beautiful acoustic song uh, you've got her in your pocket a nice slice of heavy blues with ball and biscuit heart is button a button hypnotized girl you have no faith in medicine uh this is just an absolutely fantastic record all analog as well jack and meg recorded this uh, at Toe Rag Studios in England, all analog based, and um, they were just absolutely on fire here. And I, I would say this right here is the pinnacle of the White Stripes recording legacy. This is just an absolutely flawless record and surely one of the best of the 2000s. Number 16, an album you had to get an OG copy of. For this one, I picked... Kurt Vile and the Violators, the Hunchback EP. Uh, this came out back in 2009 on CD and vinyl, and then in 2012 they did a reissue slash repressing of it. There's no real distinctive differences between the original pressing and the reissue. Um, same label, same jacket, download cards and all. Uh, but at the time when I got my hands on this, it must have been back in like early 2018. For some reason on Discogs, uh, the original pressing was much cheaper to obtain than the reissue that came out a couple years later so i went ahead and got myself the og and it's absolutely killer just great you know kind of psychedelic lo-fi kurt vile at its finest fantastic stuff number 17 the last album you purchased so i actually don't have this record physically on hand to show since i literally ordered this album on new year's day from roland rex he dropped a whole bunch of new stuff to the website and i managed to get my hands on a copy of acdc live from the atlantic studios uh now this is actually uh a promo release that came out back in 1978 it was broadcast on radio it was a transcription uh disc and copies go for like 250 bucks or more and it's been bootlegged many many times over the years uh but the copy that i managed to get is indeed an unofficial pressing but it does replicate the original 1978 jacket to the finest detail so i'm very happy that i got my hands on it because it has been a piece of acdc vinyl that i've been wanting to add to my collection for some time number 18 an album they don't get all right guys get ready to get shocked john lennon and yoko ono two virgins now i am part of the rare breed of humans <laughs> that really get off on Revolution 9 off of the White Album. There's just something very fascinating to decipher when it comes to those avant-garde tape experiments. And John Lennon was really pushing to kind of get that stuff worked in into the Beatles repertoire. And of course, he did with that particular song. Uh, but of course, he did it with Yoko as well. And this album... Um, 
comprises of the recordings that they made together uh, the first night that they spent together. And basically you have John just playing different random, you know, reels of tape and piano chords and guitar and everything. And you can kind of get into it, you know, it's very trance-like. And then all of a sudden Yoko just smacks you upside the head with the vocals. It's... It's screeching at times just to hear the vocals alone, but it's just, it's fascinating to listen to. I don't pull this off my shelf often, to be quite honest with you, but, you know, I have it because, you know, it's John Lennon, it's, you know, it connects with the Beatles, but also there's something fascinating with the art type that these two uh, were exploring uh, together back when they got together in the late 60s. Number 19. A punk album or the closest thing you have to it? To me, there's only one punk band that matters more than anything. It is the Ramones, and I picked Rocket to Russia. This is probably the quintessential Ramones album. Uh, it features Crete and Hop, Rockaway Beach, Here Today, Gone Tomorrow, I Don't Care. Of course, Sheena is a punk rocker, We're a Happy Family, Teenage Lobotomy, their cover of Surfing Bird. I mean, this is just absolutely fantastic Ramones stuff. And it's also the last album to feature the classic early lineup of Joey, Johnny, Dee Dee, and Tommy. Uh, just fantastic stuff all around. And to me, I mean, of course, you know, you have bands like the Sex Pistols and you have the Clash and all this and that. But let's face it. If it wasn't for the Ramones, there would be no punk rock as we know it. Fantastic album. And last but not least, number 20, favorite 2020 reissue. We got to end this thing on a bang. Jethro Tull's Aqualung, the UHQR pressing by Analog Productions. This is absolutely sensational by all means. I mean, if you want to hear the best definitive version of Jethro Tull's Aqualung, this is the pressing to check out. Pressed on two LPs, 45 RPM, pressed on Clarity Vinyl, which is vinyl at its purest form. I did a whole video talking about this pressing. Um, tears roll down my face when I listen to this pressing. I am not joking or over-exaggerating. Um, it just sounds so dang good. It's so lifelike and transparent. It's words can't describe it. You need to hear it for yourself. And if you jumped on this when the pre-order was up, you are very lucky because I think this is sold out right now. And of course, values for these pre uh, for these kind of pressings just skyrocket up with time. I think it might be maybe three or four times what it went for retail value back when it was up for pre-order. But um, if you got your hands on it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you have yet to check this out, um, if you're able to at some point, I mean, it's a very expensive plunge to take when it comes to a pressing of this caliber. But if you want to hear this album at its best, this is the pressing to go to. Jethro Tull's Aqualung UHQR Pressing. So there you guys go. That is my entry into the 2021 vinyl tag. Now, if you have a YouTube channel and you're curious about entering this tag and you, you have yet to do so, tag, you are it. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead, give it a like, subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support this channel, be sure to check me out on Patreon. See you guys in the next video. And most importantly, keep the records spinning.